Dragon Heist, Eberron, Rising from the Last War, The Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. These are just a few of the Dungeons & Dragons titles that my guest has worked on. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the DiceGeeks.com tabletop RPG show. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and better role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. If you're not familiar with some of my RPG resource books, you can find them all at DiceGeeks.com. They are all geared to help game masters cut down their prep time. And also you can find them on DriveThruRPG and Amazon.com. Just search for the Book of Random Tables and you'll find a whole bunch of those. Or you can search for Dice Geeks, all one word, and you will find them. Now, I have an amazing guest today, so let's just dive in. My guest today is a television writer and producer, in addition to being a tabletop role-playing game designer. Uh, his, some of his works include uh, Eberron, Rising from the Last War, Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, among others. And he is also the writer behind the World Builder blog, and he is the host of the Tabletop Babble podcast, James Introcaso. James, welcome to the show. Hey, Matt, thank you so much for having me. I I really appreciate it. Uh, This is going to be a ton of fun, uh, and I'm excited to be here. Oh, and I am excited to talk to you today. So now, uh, I usually like to start off the show just by asking my guests, how were you first introduced to tabletop role-playing games? Oh, so I have like the prototypical uh, RPG experience. My brother and his friends were playing when they were like uh, 13, 14 in our basement, my parents' basement. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was 10 years old. And I remember I was listening to his friends play and uh, I could not believe that this was a thing. Right. Like that there's this game where you can do whatever you want um, and, you know, someone is adjudicating and that kind of thing. And uh, the next time they played, they they were nice enough to let me sort of sit in and listen. Uh, The next time they played, uh, three of my friends were there and a bunch of my brother's friends had to leave. But he and his friend wanted to keep playing D&D. So they invited us to come sit at the table with them for, you know, like an hour or so and get a taste uh, and that's how I was truly introduced was a first time playing in my parents' basement. Uh, my brother wasn't running the game. One of his friends was, but we were all playing and, and you know, like very confused. It was advanced uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, at the time. So it was, you know, it was a wild, wild time. And then my friend uh, who had played with us went home and told his dad. And his dad was like, oh yeah, I, I played all the time in college and pulled out uh, a role-playing game called the fantasy trip um which is actually from steve jackson games it's a precursor to gurps uh, they just reprinted it in the the last year or so and it is uh like old school D, but much simpler uh and so we played that for years before you know moving on to uh, other things because the 10 uh, ad and d can be kind of hard to grasp uh before you've had calculus so <laughs> yeah i'd say yes uh i don't think i did any of the rules right <laughs> until I was like 17 <laughs> or anything, something like that. But, but yeah, that's interesting to hear because that is very similar to my story as well. I was nine. Uh, my, my older brother's friend, they invited us over and my brother like gets off the phone and he says, we're going to John's and we are going to play the greatest game ever made. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, I'm in. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I'm in. And so we went there and yeah, we played Dungeons and Dragons. I think we played basic though. And, um, uh, uh, I still didn't know any what I was doing, but I loved it. And then the next day, I ran my mom through a dungeon. I, uh, you know, it was just, <laughs> it was just amazing. Oh, that's amazing! That is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, you can say I was hooked, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. And very, then, very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then sadly, yeah, AD and D was a little complex. So I used, uh, I actually used West End Star Wars game to introduce a lot of my friends you know to role-playing games when we were teenagers and we had a ton of fun doing that 
Nice, nice. That is awesome. That is great. Uh, yeah, so exactly. Very, very similar story, right? And it is yep. sort of the... Um, the the kind of prototypical i think for uh for dudes our age right that's kind of the the story you hear a lot um but it's a great one uh and uh thanks to older brothers and their friends everywhere for uh, for getting us involved <laughs> <laughs> yeah no kidding you know since you you started playing though but now it's become your career or at least part of your career you you wear a lot of hats it seems but um how then do you take <laughs> uh, tabletop role playing games into being a career uh, so it's a, it's kind of a, a long story, so I will keep it uh, as summarized as I possibly can. But essentially, um, I, when I had been playing sit from that time, all different kinds of role-playing games, trying a different bunch, um, had a lot of different groups, you know, groups in high school and college and then out of college and that kind of thing. And, I was in my late 20s um, and I had done like a ton of stuff. Uh, I was always doing stuff outside of work, uh, a lot of community theater stuff or, or volunteer work or that kind of thing. And in my late 20s, I found that I suddenly didn't have any of that. I had moved and I had sort of uh, cut ties from a lot of community theater, which was, uh, you know, I love community theater and, and I think they're great. Um, but, uh, but I just was like, I was transient, moving around for work a lot. And I thought, I, I really want to do something other than sit on the couch and watch a bunch of TV. And I thought, I've always wanted to do RPG stuff. Like, uh, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts and I... I, at the time, this may be hard to believe, but at the time, there weren't a ton of RPG discussion podcasts. And there weren't even that many actual play podcasts. This was in like 2013, before there was a giant boom of all of this stuff. And I remember thinking like, I want to make an RPG or I want to listen to a show that's talking about the D&D &D next play test because that was happening mm -hmm. then. And I wasn't getting enough content. I had a, a Google news alert that I still have active now and I would get like one D and D news thing a month from it. <laughs> it was crazy. Now I get at yeah. least a dozen a day. Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, but anyway, long story longer, uh, I was talking to my wife about it and she said, you know, you know how to make this stuff. I worked in television at the time and she said, you know, you know how to produce an audio product and a video product and all this kind of stuff. Why don't you do it? Like if, if you want to say it. And I thought about it for a long time and then I thought, I do want to do this. I, I'm going to look into how I make a podcast. And so I contacted a guy named... Jeff Greiner, who works at, uh, who created the Tome Show podcast, um, and uh, which is still going today. It's like 14 years. It might be the longest running D and D chat podcast. Um, I think. I think fear the boot might uh, might uh, question that, but I, I, they've been going on a long time. But uh, who knows? <laughs> so I think it all depends on sort of what your definitions are of yeah. uh, of of different chat shows and things. And yeah, fear the boot has been around a while too. I'm not sure how long has fear the boot been around. Uh, we're going I, down rabbit. I, I, yeah, a little rabbit hole. But I I think it was. Oh man, I thought it was 14 or 15 years, I thought. Yeah, so they're they're close, right? And yeah. and so is technically the official D&D &D podcast is is kind of close to all of them. Yeah. But uh but when I reached out to Jeff, he said, um, well what show are you trying to make? And I said, I want to do this weekly news show where we talk about D&D &D news, D&D &D next play test and anything else that's coming up. And he said, would you like to make it on this feed? Um which was extremely generous of him. He didn't really know me at all and um uh, and I said, yes, of course. Yes, like, please give me access to your, uh, you know, nine years of subscribers and your wisdom and your friendliness. And, uh, and uh, so for three years, I made a podcast there. Uh, and because I knew I was going to have a built-in audience, I thought, I should really do something in addition to making this podcast. So I started a blog um, and I started to update that blog uh, first twice a week. Uh, now it's weekly. Um, and, uh, and I started to write there. And so for about, uh, three years, I was doing that constantly, putting out the blog posts, uh, putting out weekly content on the Tome Show. And uh, I had applied for some writing things here and there once I had sort of gotten some blog posts under my belt. And I thought, maybe I can do this, you know, like maybe other people want to pay me to write. And um, I was fortunate enough that Insider, uh, which is a publication put out through a Patreon run by Morris of EN World, 
Um, and uh, John Four's RoleplayingTips.com sort of took some chances on me and, and worked with me and got me a few jobs. Uh, and then I did uh, an adventure with the Adventurers League. Um, and so it sort of built from there. Uh, the, the first official hardcover that I did with Wizards of the Coast was Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Um, and uh, Chris Perkins uh, had followed me on Twitter. He follows a lot of people in the community who tweet about D&D uh, on Twitter. Um, so uh, if you're out there in the community, use that hashtag D&D and, and when you're talking about D&D and you never know who's going to follow you from mm-hmm. Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. Uh, and I got a DM from him one day asking, uh, hey, do you have anything on the DMs Guild? Uh, and I had. Uh, so when the DMs Guild launched, um, they'd said, like, Watsi will be looking for new writers here. And I had all this content on my blog, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought, I just need to get this into a form where it can be on the DMs Guild. Like, the writing is done. Um, how hard could it be? Uh, the answer is very hard. Um, but I did, uh, in the early days of the guild, I put some stuff on there as well, uh, from my blog, uh, that had, you know, had comments, uh, from the community and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so I said to him, yeah, I do have some things. And I sent him some stuff that was on there. Uh, and then a month later, uh, he said, you know, would you like to work on the next hardcover D&D book? I'm putting together a team of writers. Um, and that book was Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and, and that uh, really helped uh, everything kind of take off. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it was a high profile gig. Uh, I got some more work with Wizards of the Coast um, and my own career kind of grew and snowballed from there. <laughs> kind of in this day and age, you, you hear a lot of people want to work in creative fields and things like that. What would your advice be to somebody out there who's like, you know, I, I really want to write for D&D or I want to work in some kind of creative field? What would your advice be to them? Yeah. So I would say that the first thing you should really do is, is do it for yourself, right? Like um, it's hard to this day and age, get a creative gig. It's always been hard, right? Everybody wants those jobs because they're fun uh, and they're fulfilling. Um, And, uh, and so you need to, uh, you need to write for a couple reasons, right? So don't wait for someone to pay you to do it. Uh, You have to do it yourself because you have to have something to show right you have to show that i can do this um and so uh having a body of work helps you do that it also helps you practice right Uh, the the whole ten thousand hours practice makes perfect whatever cliche you want to use um is true uh the more you write uh the better you will get at it um and if you're willing to put that work out in front of the uh harsh harsh critics of the internet um you know they, they will give you feedback that in many cases will be valuable um you know be ready for uh jerks and you don't have to listen to every piece of advice you get but if you're overwhelmingly being told uh, a piece of criticism about you know um yeah. a piece of your work it's like well maybe that's true and maybe i should look into how i fix that um yeah. so and then the other thing is that in the RPG world, uh, if you're making your own stuff, that is often actually the best way to monetize your work these days, right? Yeah. Um, publishers don't pay a ton, uh, and it's not like they're robber barons, right, who are <laughs> twirling their mustaches. Um, they're sticking to some old business models that I think could use an update. Uh, but uh, you have the power through Patreon, through all of these different marketplaces, um, to sell your stuff and you might make more money that way and you get to make what you want to create. Um, the final reason to do it is to see if you actually want to do it, right? I, like I love uh, being a dungeon master and I love writing adventures and designing games, uh, but those are not the same skills. Um, there's a little of overlap, but uh, often you should find like, what do I actually want to do? Cause maybe what you actually want to do is, be Matt Mercer, right? And and you should be working on uh, DMing full time, or you should figure out a way to pitch yourself as a person who does corporate team builders because you you love role playing. You know, mm-hmm. figure out: Do you actually want to design games, or do you just want to do something in the RPG space that is that? And and if by actually writing, you will know: Is this something I want to do or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you touched on a lot of a lot of topics there, and I and I think absolutely, you know, what you said is absolutely true, and I just think uh, the idea of getting your stuff out there because because people just don't know what you can do until you do something, 
And it's, mm-hmm. it's not anybody's fault, right? They just don't know what you can do until you put something out there. So I think uh, uh, that is perfect advice that you just get something out there and let people react to it. And then, yes, critics, uh, the internet can be, can be a harsh place. I have, uh, you know, I, I obviously self-publish a lot of books and it's, I have been, you know, told that, you know, I'm everything, right? From a scam artist to whatever, you know, and <laughs> to things that I don't care to repeat, right? And it's just like, sure. what, you know, what in the yeah. world? But, you know, you, you obviously have to weigh that criticism. And sometimes, you know what, the, the honest criticism, right? You just look at it and say, you know what, that's absolutely correct. I need to fix this book <laughs> and I will <laughs> fix that book. Um, some of the other stuff you just have to power through and just say, okay, well, you know, people will be whatever, you know, if they want to be jerks, they can be jerks. And I got to do what I got to do. So, <laughs> you, know, you know, as I talk to more and more people, I guess, you know, now I have, you know, some people asking me about things and, you know, working, you know, in creative fields and that. And it's just, um, mm-hmm. what, what would you say to the person who's like, you know, hey, I've been, I've been running games for a long time. I've created a lot of material, but I'm just kind of uh, afraid to put it out there. What would you say to somebody like that? Yeah. So, and I, uh, first I would say, I think that is a valid fear, right? That yeah. you're afraid to, to put things out there. That's, t- I totally understand that. And you should prepare yourself for, uh, that there are people out there who are going to crap on your stuff for no reason other than they, they get some jollies being mean on the internet. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but you don't care what that person thinks anyway. Yeah. You know, uh, that's, mm-hmm. that's what I've come to realize is that the people who want to give constructive feedback mm-hmm. um, and the people who are really supportive in the community, mm-hmm. you would be missing out on those people. Yeah. And those people are really great. Also, mm-hmm. if you don't put your stuff out, right, yeah. it's never going to go anywhere. Um, there's no way that your stuff will ever uh, be appreciated or seen or used by anybody else if you keep it and and don't share it with anybody else. So if your goal is to have that stuff seen and shared and to become a game designer, right, uh, mm-hmm. then you need to share your stuff one way or another, right? Um, and uh, the m- one big thing that I have learned, right, the reason that I needed the blog and the reason that I needed the podcast was they gave me deadlines. Um, so when I was writing, like when you're writing for yourself, you don't have to put anything out, right? No one is, is other than yourself that is saying, this needs to go out now. This needs to uh, be put in front of the public for whatever reason. Um, and so like I know from blogging, if you're consistent with blogging, if you update the same time every week or every month or whenever your, whatever your schedule is, if you mm-hmm. stick to that schedule... Uh, your audience grows. Uh, it's proof. Everybody who blogs will will tell you that. And so, and if you don't, if you have a more erratic schedule, uh, odds are you're not going to build an audience that way. And so I was thinking to myself like, okay, every you know Thursday, something needs to appear on my blog. A blog post must appear, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that forced me to put things out before I was uh, 100% satisfied with them, which is an important lesson to learn because a lot of people, uh, it's like, woof, I am never going to be satisfied. Things need to get to good enough, not perfect, mm-hmm. um, because you'll just never finish uh, if, if you're a perfectionist, um, because perfect is uh, a, an impossible ideal. No, I think that's great advice too. And just, uh, I think what I tell a lot of people, it's just if, if you've been saying to yourself, oh, I want to be a writer since you were, you know, a preteen or something like that, and it just never kind of came about, and you've always kind of thought, you know, you've been running games, and you've kind of just always thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I could publish some of this stuff? If you've been, if you're that kind of person that's been saying that, then you should try to publish something, and just to mm-hmm. really see what it, what it's like, because you, you shouldn't let that kind of uh, I don't know, that dream or those thoughts just kind of sit there in the background because you should, uh, you should get it out before it becomes a regret if, if you've been having that, you know, those thoughts for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally uh, uh, agree with that a thousand percent, um, you know. So uh, I'm on, on board. Put your stuff out there uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and and we will praise it. Like that's the thing is there's a lot of people in this community who are just going to say, 
good for you for making a thing yeah. and putting it out there. That took Absolutely. guts and took time and hard effort and like good for you. And you'll be surprised at the number of people who say that as well as, ooh, this is overpowered. This is game breaking. Oh no, you've destroyed d d <laughs> uh, You haven't, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I think there, there are, I mean, my appreciation uh, have, have since I have begun self-publishing, just my appreciation of somebody who especially, you know, they work in a totally different field. They have, you know, a family and all kinds of other responsibilities. And then just to be able to put together something and publish it, uh, I mean, you're, you know, they're my heroes, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that is just great stuff. And, and that is, that is a first step into a larger world, as Obi-Wan would say. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's a great way to put it. Uh, I may steal that if that's okay with you. Yeah. You're welcome to steal. You're welcome to steal. <laughs> and, in, and speaking of stealing, um, yes. as, as great writers do, um, <laughs> what, uh, you know, I, I'm always just interested in hearing about uh, people's influences. Like, what are you, you know, like, what are you reading? What are you watching? What, what do you think informs your writing when you approach, uh, you know, something? Yeah. So I, uh, one thing is I read and, uh, play a lot of role-playing games. I try to play a lot of different games, um, which I think is also an important thing to do if you are a uh, role-playing game designer is to look at, um, not just the game that you want to design. That's very important, right? You should know the game you want to design. You should play the game you want to design. But you should look at and play other games because they'll help. Uh, you'll, you'll start to see then patterns and understand better how games work with a wider perspective. Uh, you'll discover new stuff. It's a good excuse to play more games, uh, which is something I think we all want to do, yeah, right? absolutely. So I... A lot of my reading uh, is role-playing games, uh, and I like that. Like, I like to read them for pleasure. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, so I, I read a lot of that, and I watch a lot of uh, a lot of different things um, with my my wife. So, my other career is in uh, is in television. I write and produce TV commercials and and web videos and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, and I really like to watch uh, a lot of different things. I'm very into uh, the nerd culture and fantasy that we have going on right now. Um, So, you know, anything big that we have heard people talking about, I've watched The Witcher, I have watched Stranger Things, uh, I have watched uh, Altered Carbon and things like that. Um, So all all of those nerd things uh, are on there. I also like to watch... um, some sort of uh, serious storytelling and and comedies that are a little more, I, I guess you would say, grounded, uh, uh, or they take place in quote unquote the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I get a lot of uh, like uh, I watch Better Call Saul. I think is one of the one of the most fun um, and and uh, twisty turny sort of shows on TV. And I think you can get a lot of ideas about good storytelling uh, by watching that. Um, I really like watching uh, the the television show Brooklyn Nine Nine. Um, I think Brooklyn Nine Nine is probably more like most adventuring parties uh, than uh, perhaps The Witcher is sometimes. <laughs> um, in that you know, it's all of these people who are who are getting together and have fun, but they are like solving crimes uh they are uh they often have um these big plot twists sometimes there are more mundane things that take up their time uh, but those are still interesting stories right um and so i i like to look uh at those um and uh, as far as uh, influences go, um, like when I think about game designers, there's a lot of people that I really like. Uh, people who work on uh, gumshoe games. Mm-hmm. Um, Chris Spivey, uh, who made uh, Harlem Unbound, which is uh, actually both a gumshoe game and a Call of Cthulhu game, uh, is really great. Uh, Ken Height, Knights Black Agents. Uh, I like Ruth Tillman, I think, is a really amazing game designer. She's worked on all of the uh, the gumshoe stuff. So that's really interesting to me um, from like a a story perspective from a 
uh, from adventure design perspective, I'm a big uh, Sly Flourish fan. Mike Shea, um, who I uh, am fortunate enough to be friends with now, uh, I think is great. Obviously, everybody over at WotC, you know, I, I've been following Chris Perkins for years. I've been following uh, Jeremy Crawford for years. Uh, Wes Schneider, who's over there. Um, Orion, uh, who is a new narrative designer that they've just hired over there. They are... Uh, the creator of a game called uh, Mutants in the Night, which uses the Blades in the Dark system. That is really, really great. So there's, uh, I could sit here and name game designers who I think are influences on me all day. Uh, I do have to shout out Will Doyle and Sean Merwin, who are two people that I've worked with, but whose people, but I, their stuff I have been reading forever in the D and D world as well. Um, so, uh, so yeah, those are just a, a handful of influences for me. <laughs> Okay. Well, I mean, that's a lot, but yeah, Mm -hmm. Uh, no, that's great. Um, I was wondering too, uh, you know, I know, uh, you know, a lot of people who play are, are curious about uh, kind of the RPG industry and that. Um, So maybe first, you know, I know you're usually listed as a designer uh, in some of the titles uh, that I've seen. Could you define kind of that job title? What does it, what does that actually mean? Yeah. So, (laughs) <laughs> so designer I think is a is what we would think of as a person who writes products um you know an author would be another term a writer would be a, another term uh, I think the reason we refer to game designers as designers is because it's really a, a lot of game design writing is is technical writing right mm-hmm. um it, it, with a with a blend of creative and storytelling in there but we like an author I think when you say author right it conjures to mind this idea of someone who is a novelist right yeah. um uh, which author can mean many other things uh, and and can be a synonym for game designer. Um, so, but I think the reason we stick to designer more closely is it's a little more specific and it does say like this person designed the scenarios within this adventure that you're reading, designed the rules for the system that you are reading. And so you're more like, uh, in in some respects, you're more like an architect or a mathematician because you are designing uh, something. And it doesn't mean you need to have necessarily the greatest math skills in the world to be a game designer, but it does mean you need to be able to think technically about uh, different scenarios. Um, you know, and and so and some things I think are more technical than others, right? A, a book of an adventure. Uh, maybe is not as is more story focused in some ways than uh, like a core rule book for a role playing game. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, but uh, both are I would say are designers. Okay, okay, no, that's good. That's uh, I think that helps to kind of understand. Uh, there just seems to be kind of so many terms thrown around. There's designer, lead designer, narrative <laughs> designer. Uh, you know, yes. Sometimes you hear you know different different terms like that. And it it can be confusing for somebody who's definitely not in the industry, I guess. Yeah. And I think, like I said, I think it's a fancy word for author. It's often like we hear the word producer thrown around in TV and movies, right? Mm -hmm. But producer means a zillion different things. Designer means you have written something. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're a narrative designer, you were probably more focused on the story of something, right? You were, you were piecing together the, the story for these monsters and a, you know, a designer might've been doing the statistics for the, the monsters and they often work hand in hand, you know, they pass stuff back and forth. Uh, and a lead designer is usually the person who writes a lot of stuff, but then also looks over everybody else's stuff and it's kind of their voice that is in the product. Okay. No, that, uh, that's very helpful. Thank you for kind of mm-hmm. explaining that. But, um, I guess I, I'm also curious, and I think a lot of people would be as well, just about uh, kind of what kind of like the design process looks like. So uh, your work that I'm most familiar with is the Eberron Rising from the Last War. I've been kind of pouring over that recently, and hopefully oh, nice. I will get to run uh, something set in that world here. Um, I don't know when, but hopefully <laughs> it will be soon. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, so maybe could you just kind of give us like, you know, like I said, just kind of a window into the process. So like, you know, kind of like, where does it start? And then how do you work together as a team and just kind of give us an idea of how something like that would look? 
Sure. Yeah. So uh, every uh, Wizards of the Coast project that I've worked on is a little different. Um, so, uh, and I've I've been fortunate enough that I've worked kind of. Uh, they they keep passing me uh, around uh, there. So the lead designer on pretty much every project I've worked on has been different. Right. Um, I worked with Chris Perkins on Waterdeep, uh, Dragon Heist, and Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and then I worked with uh, Mike Merles and Kate Welsh for Ghosts of Saltmarsh, and I worked with with um, uh, Adam Lee uh, for the Baldur's Gate Descent to Avernus, and then Jeremy on Eberron Rising from the Last War, and Matt Mercer was really my main contact for Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, and then um, they just announced Mythic Odysseys of Theros, which I also was fortunate enough to work on. Uh, I worked with Wes Schneider on that, right? So it's... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I have run the gamut over there, um, and a couple of things make each project different. One is the amount I'm being asked to write. Mm-hmm. Um, and two is uh, the the deadline. Uh, and I guess three would be the the person, right, who's working on it and how they prefer to lead a project. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so in many cases, if it's something like a, uh, like a big hardcover adventure, um, you get what's called a story Bible, which is uh, the lead designer has put together a document that is about mm, 50-ish pages uh, that says, you know, uh, here's sort of the overall story we're going for in this, this adventure. Here's information about the setting where it takes place. Here's information about the NPCs. Here's new monsters and magic items that might be in there that we can use. It's kind of like a toy box of, uh, of things. And that goes not only to the team that's going to be writing that hardcover, but then all of the WOTC partners, right? Um, mm-hmm. So it's a document that gets used by, uh, you know, people making video games and miniatures and things like that uh, and concept artists and, and that sort of thing. So then we take that and uh, you're often for the, the book that you're writing, you're also given an outline and that outline is divvied up and it says like, okay, you've got the Bible that has all the toys in it. You've got an outline that has sort of the big story beats you need to hit. Uh, and then we have a bunch of meetings about like what should go in these chapters, right? Um, you know, like, like the main outline, we know that in chapter three, chapter three must start where chapter two ends and chapter, and it must end where chapter four begins, right? But how do we get there? What's in the middle? Uh, those are all kind of up to the designer uh, more or less, you know, and they'll chat with the lead designer about like, what do you want to see? I'm thinking this. What do you think about this, right? Uh, through email or phone conversations or sometimes WOTC will uh, bring people out depending on how much time they have. Uh, how much you're writing, all that kind of stuff. So like for Baldur's Gate, I went out uh, to be, to have like a, a meeting with Watsi and talk about it. Um, for Waterdeep, we had meetings every week, uh, Joey Hake and I, with Chris Perkins over Skype. Um, for Eberron, uh, I was doing significantly less. So I did like over 50,000 words on those books. For Eberron, I was only doing about 25 Um and the deadline was super tight uh, because they realized, uh, you know, they had they were working on some stuff and that some things were changing around and they needed some more text and um, and so that was like an email with a kind of detailed outline of like this is what we'd like to see. Uh, here are some notes from Jeremy and from Keith Baker uh, and go right and like uh, write what you have. And now often then you'll write your first draft. Um, and it will go to the lead designer who will maybe give notes and you'll bounce it back uh, two, three, more if you have time, times until the, the deadline comes, right? Mm-hmm. And then they'll take it and uh, at that point, it is in Watsi's hands and they finish the product, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like, I didn't see, on, on everything I've worked, I don't see feedback from playtesters. I don't see feedback from editors. I'm only working with the lead designer. And then the, you know, often things will change a little bit or a lot of it uh, based on all of that feedback that comes from playtesters, designers, uh, you know, anything else that, that could happen. Um, so, uh, but in the case of Rising from the Last War, right, the deadline was so tight that I gave them my first draft and they were like, this is good. Uh, you know, we, we will, we'll take it from here because we really need to keep moving fast and can't keep pack, passing stuff back and forth. Um, so, uh, so with that in mind, right. 
the big advice for when you're working with somebody is make your first draft as good as you can, right? <laughs> um, you know, because you never know when it'll be like uh, your job as the designer, especially when you're part of a team, is to make the best thing possible. So make it as good as you can in the time that you have. Uh, ask questions when you need to, right? And, and get it over. So that was how um, Rising from the Last War went. What are some examples? What did you write for Eberron? Or is it easy to kind of pull some of those things apart? Or does it just go into the hole? Yeah. So for Eberron, I wrote a lot about Sharn. Um, so uh, some of what I wrote is in the, I think it's the third chapter of the book is all about Sharn. Um, Sharn is the the big like city of towers. It's kind of like the New York City of Eberron. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, there's a lot of, uh, information in there that is about, uh, yes, Sharn City of Towers, uh, in, information about the watch and information about uh, the sort of criminal rings that are in there. Okay. Um, so I wrote some of what's in there. I wrote, there's like a table of what happens when you fall in Sharn and a table <laughs> of uh, some locations and things like that. So, so a little bit smattered throughout there. And then a lot of what I did is in the building adventures chapter. Okay. So the adventures in Sharn section, uh, I wrote the first draft of, and the adventure that is in the book, Forgotten Relics, um, I also wrote the the first draft of. Uh, and I'm happy uh, to report that in this case, um, a lot of what I wrote is pretty close to the the first draft. You know, obviously things are, are adjusted here and there, um, but no major rewrites or anything like that. And that does happen sometimes, and that's uh, part of the gig. You get paid for the words you write still, you know, and things could change for reasons way beyond your control, right? Like, oh, we had to cut 20 pages from this um, because the, the book was too big. And so, you know, you wrote exactly what you should have, and it was right, but we had to figure out how to cut things and some of your stuff got cut and that's just part of it um you know and and that stuff might get used later on in dragon plus or somewhere else so uh yeah yeah no that, thank you so much for that kind of insight there it's just always you know fascinating for outsiders looking in to to hear some of the process uh, um and i'm wondering too just uh now that you are writing more adventures writing settings and campaigns has that changed the way you run your games at your table uh the way so you write them yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what's interesting is uh, there's uh, uh, over the the last several years i've definitely changed the way that i run things to, at the uh -huh. table uh -huh. um you know i i played for years and years and years and i think i had got into some bad gm habits uh -huh. um and i am definitely uh can definitely, you maybe tell us what some of those are Sure. Yeah. Uh, so over preparation, um, which, you know, I don't know that there's, if you like to prep, there's nothing wrong with prepping a bunch mm -hmm. other than you need to be willing to throw that out the window, right? Yeah. You need to be willing to say when the players go left and you, you prepared for them to go right, you need to be willing to say all this stuff is going away and maybe I'll use it later, right? Like maybe I'll, uh, I'll pull it out or maybe I can salvage some of it by, uh, you know, flipping it around, whatever it is. Um, but, uh, if you don't write, that leads to railroading because when your players go left, you'll say, well, sorry, there's a cliff left. You, you can't do anything, but yeah. left is the abyss. <laughs> you will die if you go left. So you must go right. Right. Um, oh, yeah. so, uh, so yeah. And I think writing adventures has, has truly taught me like, well, you can't, like even when you're getting paid and you have all the time in the world, you cannot cover every single scenario. So you need to yeah. think more broadly. You need to think about like, uh, so now when I think of write a dungeon, right. Um, mm -hmm. both for publication and for my players, I don't say, uh, I don't say like, this is what must happen in the dungeon. Right. Mm -hmm. I say, this is what is currently going on when the characters arrive in the dungeon. And here's like, if they do this, you know, here's something that might happen. Here's a few things enough to give the DM stuff to go on. Right. But it's more about saying like, this is the NPC that is in this dungeon. This is their personality. So the DM knows, well, here's a different couple, here's a few different ways they might react uh, based on, you know, what I know about their personality. Instead of saying, if the players attack, they do this. If the players, you know, try to fake them out, they do this. If the players do blah, 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 you know. Um, so uh, rather than being prescriptive, being descriptive, I think has really helped. No, that's good. And uh, so, yeah, definitely over prep 
is certainly a, a bad habit that any DM or GM could get into. Um, mm-hmm. I even wrote a book called The No Prep Game Master <laughs> because I was uh, so tired of, of prepping and hearing people talk about, uh, well, we couldn't play this week because I didn't have time to prep. And it's just like, I never want to hear somebody say that. I, wa- I always want to hear people say, we got to play this week and we had a blast. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. And that's the big thing, right? I would rather... Especially people have like put aside time, you know, they, they've put aside time for this. So I would rather be able to run a game for people um, than not. And, you know, when you asked about influences, I, I didn't mention Adam Coble, right, who oh, yeah. uh, is one of the authors of Dungeon World. Um, yeah. And I think reading any, that's one re- good reason to read RPGs, reading like Dungeon World or other Powered by the Apocalypse games that say like, don't prep at all. Uh, you know, here's how you can feel safe running a game, uh, because I do think prep is a lot about, we don't want to be caught with our pants down, right? We don't want to be caught in a situation where we're like, we don't know what we're doing and the illusion is shattered and no one's immersed in, (laughs) um, you know, but by saying like, here's how you can go with the flow and, uh, you know, the lazy dungeon master by Mike Shea, uh, I think is also good for that. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. And 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 two, even even if you're running a published adventure that's outstanding, like I've been running Curse of Strahd recently, and it's outstanding. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. I love every bit of it. My players are loving it. But uh, you know, a couple sessions ago, m- one of my players cast Speak with Animals on Rictavio's saber tooth tiger. Well, <laughs> that's not in the book, right? Like, there's nothing right. that the saber tooth and of course it it can't be right because how who knows that somebody's going to do that? So, I just mm-hmm. had to just make up what Rictavio's tiger says on the fly, and of course I used some hints that were in the book and some things that are given, but it's like I just had to make all that up, and yeah. you know I think. Uh, that we need to kind of, you know, that uh, game masters should kind of loosen up a little bit, give themselves permission to uh, to make things up, uh, give per, you know themselves permission to ask their players sometimes. You know, if your player keeps asking you, oh, what's on that island on the coast over there? Just, okay, say, okay, you keep asking about an island. Uh, what do you think's on there? What is it, you know, give me, you know, let me know something, you know, and, and I, I think we just kind of need to give ourselves permission that we don't have to, uh, be fully, you know, we don't have to have the novel written of our of our adventure before we begin. That we can just make up yeah. things as we go. <laughs> yeah, and what right? What you're talking about with uh, with that Rictavio's tiger example is an edge case, right? The, it's not in the adventure because it's like, woof, how many people are going to have this spell prepared? Exactly. Uh, how often is this going to happen? Right, but. Mm-hmm. I think edge cases are also the things that make memories, right? When a player says, oh, you're at a convention. Somebody says, can you believe I did this, right? I talked to Rictavio's Tiger and everybody's like, that's a great idea. I can't believe I didn't think. You know, like mm-hmm. players are looking for edge cases and, yes. uh, and edge cases are what make great memories. So you want to be willing to lean into those, not, uh, not take away those experiences because you have a good idea. Um, you want to, let the players bring their good ideas and surprise and delight you. It'll make your life so much easier once you yeah. are able to let go of that. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's hard and scary at first. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And uh, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Those uh, when, when something like that improvisation between players and game masters happens at the table like that, those are the best memories that you form because Everybody kind of knows, oh, well, that wasn't planned, but it happened and it worked in the story. Isn't that so cool? You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, What are some, I guess, uh, some other bad habits? So over prep would be one. What are some other bad habits that you may have gotten into uh, so yeah, over prep and, and, you know, that leading me to railroading oh, players, yeah. right. I think mm-hmm. is, is the, the, the biggest one, um, is I've just become a far more open GM, mm-hmm. uh, uh, with respect to that. Um, the other thing that I, that I get into is I lean, uh, in D and D in particular, I lean too much on combat. And the reason I do that, um, I, I've realized is that for me, and I think for many other people, combat is extremely comfortable. Yeah. Combat is when D and D becomes more like a board game, right? We we break down everything you do is a rule. Moving is a rule. Drawing a weapon is a rule. Attacking mm-hmm. is a rule. Casting a spell is a rule, and that makes it easier to adjudicate for us, mm-hmm. right? That makes it easier to to referee what's happening, and so 
I think uh, learning to push myself out of my comfort zone has led to games where like combat is more meaningful because it only happens when it is meaningful, right? Yeah. Instead of it being like, here's another three goblins, here's another, you know, um, six orcs that are attacking you. Uh, it, it has become far more interesting, meaningful, and exciting for my players when it happens. And my players are doing more of what they want to do. Um, you know, they're not all super combat oriented. Uh, some players are, and, and that's great. Uh, I love combat as a player. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, so that has sort of really helped me. Uh, again, adventure design has really helped me think about, like, how do I create an interesting story that isn't just combat, 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 combat yeah. constantly? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that is a great point because, um, yeah, like my example with the uh, Rictavio's tiger, if it would have been easier for me to run a random encounter with direwolves than it was for me to make up what the tiger is talking about. And, uh, so it, it can be kind of used like that. But I, I think too, if you're running a, uh, no prep game that you can use combat in a couple different ways. I think you can use it one as a stall for time. So you can give them a nice encounter and you can be thinking of other things while you're just going kind of going through some rules. But then I think too, if you're just sitting down at the table and you're going to run something without any prep that you can throw your players into a combat encounter and the questions that the players start asking from that encounter could then become the adventure. They say, oh, well, why were there so many goblins attacking this little outpost tower here? Uh, we should look into that. Um, we look in the woods for goblin tracks. And well, then pretty soon you can just no prep and say, okay, well, you follow the tracks to a, you know, a cave entrance or whatever. And, and just kind of organically, you've got an adventure coming out and it all started with that you just had your players and you just threw you know, a, a random combat encounter at them. Yeah, yeah, very true, right? Um, you know, I love to love to just sit down and see where things go, right? Yeah. What what happens? It's a it's a fun way to do it, and and I think remembering too that often when we do these things, we're among friends, right? Yeah, uh, they want us to succeed. They want to have a good time, and so they're going to work with you to do that. Um, yeah. You know, uh, they're they're not. We I think sometimes as GMs have this impression of players like sitting back with their arms folded, like oh right now entertain us, right? And it's like well. <laughs> They gave up their time to be there. They didn't pay pay you for anything usually. Uh, so, like, let's all have fun together. They're going to put in some work too. They're expecting to, and they want to. Yeah, and yeah, and and I would say yes. If you're playing with players who who aren't doing that, then probably should find some other people to play with, um, because uh, uh, mm -hmm. there is really nothing like you know working together with players who just want to have a fun time too and are hoping that you come up with some cool stuff or giving you material to come up with some amazing things as the session or the, you know, the campaign progresses. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, did you have any other uh, GM bad habits you think you had to break out <laughs> other than that? Uh, yeah. So I, uh, you know, this is sort of an above the table thing, but um, sure. I uh, have to, uh, had to also get brave about, uh, you know, talking to people about what is and is not cool at the table, right? Oh, yeah. um, and, and so, you know, so often because in high school and college uh, I played with, and I think this is true for many people, the same people over and over again, mm -hmm. you don't use things like session zero uh, because you may not know they exist. And by the time you do, you're like, well, we, we all know each other pretty well, right? Um, yeah. we're, we're comfortable. But then when you get into convention settings or playing with new people or that kind of thing, you have to be, uh, when you're running the game, you need to be an advocate for the players. And if one player is uh, being obnoxious or a bully in some way, you know, obviously there are times when it's clear cut, like, okay, I need to step in here, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think knowing the times when it's not as clear cut, when it's like, oh, this person is uh, making someone uncomfortable or they're uh, taking up too much of the spotlight and not sharing with others. How do you talk to somebody about that? How do you make that clear? Because often those people don't actually want to do that thing, right? They, they're covering up their own insecurities. Like, oh, I, I thought this was how I was supposed to play D&D. &D, right? Like, I, this is, I didn't realize I wasn't sharing enough. I didn't realize that I was... Uh, making somebody else uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. Um, and so learning that and having the the courage to uh, talk to people like that uh, is important. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And and sometimes I, I tend to forget about that because I, I do play with a group of friends that I have known for, you know, most 
I guess most for 20 years and then a few for 10 years at least. So Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I do tend to forget that, but that is always kind of important because uh, everybody, you know, that I play with every Wednesday night knows exactly how I run my games, what I don't allow at the table and how, you know, how I like to be treated and how I want to see other players be treated. And so I I think that is uh, an important point that we should be clear. And I, I do. I, I know I hear a lot of advice being given on this topic online. And uh, usually a lot of the advice is to talk to that player alone about mm-hmm. the thing. But I, I think that's it should be the exact opposite. If you're at the table, you know, and you're gaming with people you haven't known, you as the game master, you set what's allowed at your table kind of clearly at the beginning. If somebody crosses that, you, you bring it out at the table, I think, because the peer pressure at the table, people will then realize, you know, they seem to realize a little bit more like, oh, right. I was actually doing something that was a little wrong, um, our off color for this table. And they can kind of respond to that uh, uh, with a little bit more of kind of a, you know, a social pressure than trying to talk to somebody alone, which can be uncomfortable for each person. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree a thousand percent. <laughs> How about you? Do, do you have any any habits that you have learned, uh, you know, or, or unlearned, I guess? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it, it does sound similar. I mean, uh, over prep was one. Um, definitely. Uh, I you know, uh, after, you know, kind of after my first experience, you know, like I said, I had mentioned earlier running my mom through a dungeon when I didn't even know the rules to the game. Um, I should have stuck with more of that kind of thing because, uh, after that, you know, as I got older, yeah, I started prepping things and I wanted to, I wanted to tell stories, you know, and, uh, basically I wanted you, you know, I wanted my players to run through my, fantasy you know my fantasy right, story right and i just wanted them to run through that and if they turned left when i needed them to turn right i would get upset of course they were upset so you know i kind of threw that out and then um i guess the other thing then that i did i swung to the kind of the other side is i allowed my players a complete sandbox but i tried to prepare as much of that sandbox as i could and i prepared lots and lots of things um and then nobody ever saw those things because they went only to you know um i mean one of the examples that i usually talk about is i uh for a star wars game i created 12 star systems not planets i created Mm. 12 star systems each with multiple planets each with gas giants with you know 70 80 moons and i created a lot of material for that well my players went to two planets not two solar systems they went to two planets you know during the course of the campaign so i had a lot of that material that they just didn't even touch so i i kind of swung from being you know railroad prep to sandbox prep to now that i you know Obviously, I have family and a lot of responsibilities and things. So if I get three hours to play one night a week, you know, I don't have three hours to prepare the night before, right? That's booked. So I usually just come to the table uh, and no prep it and, uh, you know, get ideas and clues from, you know, my players asking what we're going to play, what kind of system we're going to play and things like that. But, you know, and my prep usually includes, you know, uh, while I'm taking a shower or while I'm driving someplace or while I'm reading a book or while I'm watching a movie, just thinking about some possible things that I could use in the game. So that's kind of uh, what I had, those two big ones, the over prep railroad or the over prep sandbox that I just had to kind of just let go of and get those out of me (laughs) and let go of that and just realize that, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and I can sit down at the table and yeah, if, People just have, you know, uh, you know, give me certain characters, let me know what they're about. I can throw them into a situation and then pretty soon we can have a fun campaign uh, going. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That is, I mean, that's great advice. Yeah. That's great advice. (laughs) Well, thank you. Um, Well, thank you so much for being generous with your time, James, today. Um, Where can people find out more about you and can listen to your podcast and see your website and stuff like that? Um, so if people want to, uh, listen to me, uh, continue to talk about games, um, if they head on over to don't split the podcast network.com, that's a podcast network that I co-own, uh, with a guy named Rudy Basto, who is amazing. Um, 
Tabletop Babble uh, is the podcast I host. It's very similar to this one. So if you like this show, you might like that. Uh, it's the inferior version of this show. Oh, um, no, please. And, uh, <laughs> and you can also find me at worldbuilderblog.com, jamesintracasso.com, and at jamesintracasso on Twitter. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the kind words. And uh, I will uh, include links uh, to your blog and to your podcast, um, and as well as to some of the products that you have written uh, or have been a writer for uh, in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com. So everybody listening should head over to dicegeeks.com and check out the show notes for this episode uh, so they can learn more about James and his work. So James, just uh, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Matt. I really appreciate it. Well, there you have it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with James today. It was just a pleasure to be able to interview him. And as I mentioned in the episode, I have provided links to some of the Dungeons & Dragons titles that he has worked on in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com. I have also provided a link to his podcast, which you should really check out. He has some fantastic guests, and they dive deep into Dungeons & Dragons, role-playing games, game mastering, game design. It is fantastic. Now, if you want some free stuff, you're going to want to head over to dicegeeks.com slash free. You'll get 10 free dungeon maps, plus you'll never miss an episode of this show. You know what, guys? Each and every Wednesday, I interview somebody who will help us become better game masters, better role players, better storytellers. If you enjoy these episodes, please consider supporting the show in some way. You can leave a review wherever you're listening to this show. You can tell a friend about this podcast. You can also consider supporting the show financially by heading over to patreon.com slash dicegeeks. If you did any of those things, I would greatly appreciate it. Now, I thank you so much, and until next time, keep gaming.